Welcome into another edition of the Hops and Spirits Podcast. We're closing in on uh, Whiskey Weeks, which is happening in September. We've got a great lineup for you there, but we're in the midst of some hoppy and some spirit talk. Uh, we did some tequila last week with El Bandito and Chris Chelios, uh, former NHL All-Star, now entrepreneur. And this week we've got another entrepreneurial uh, man that's doing some great things in Umberto Lucchini. Uh, to talk about all of his work. But before we get to that, don't forget to check us out on all of our social media at Hop Spirits, all one word on Instagram, Facebook, Twitter, and TikTok. You can also find us on YouTube as well and our website, hopspirits.com, where you can find all sorts of great things as we continue to add a whole lot of fun. And also, if you stick around and check out our social media, you'll find our next giveaway, uh, which is a lot of fun and will have you laughing. I can promise you that. But we're here to talk some hops and spirits and spirits this week. And a lot of different ones as we welcome in Umberto Lucini. Did I say that right? Yes. Yes, you're good. All right. You're good. You're safe. <laughs> I always, even, I always no, practice no, it beforehand. Right. Normally it always doesn't. It goes well then. And then when I get it, you know, the red button's on, the red light's on, it never always goes so well. So I always like to just double check. But he is the owner or founder proprietor of Wolf Spirit Distillery. Got an amazing story. And thanks for joining us. Well, thanks for having me. I, 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 one thing of America I, I really like is the fact that everybody's from somewhere around the world. And so the names, the names, you always have to be careful. I, if you go back to Italy, where I was born and raised, I mean, the, it's Italian names. So you're, you're never questioning how to say someone's name. It never comes to your mind. Then you move here and you're like, wait, <laughs> I'm, I'm talking to the rest of the world probably. <laughs> well, I mean, my last name has an extra E on the end. We like, I, You'd be surprised. Jonathan Green gets misspelled a lot. You'd, there's enough variations yeah. that, you know, it, you just never know what's going to happen. Yeah. Um, now, I always like to start these things off with one tough question, which is really a fun question. And for you, because sure. I, I know you, one of your hobbies is traveling. So I figured I'd go with, would you rather go to the mountains for a getaway or down to the beach in the, or, or lake getaway? What, what are you preferring? Mountains all along. Any particular reason just takes you back home or, or what? Yeah. Yeah. I, uh, I was born and raised in Milan every weekend in the winter. We were two, two hours away from skiing. Um, and that it's the only place I, I actually bought a house. Um, back in Switzerland, uh, traveled all over the world and lived in many places, but my only actual investment in real <laughs> estate has been, uh, in the mountains and there's something majestic. And at the same time, I feel protected, uh, as much as it, the ocean is magnificent. Mm -hmm. It's, it's, it's magnitude makes humbles you. The mountains have that same effect. And I think I just like the 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 altitude aspect of it and the fact that you get four seasons like you can't get a, a, on the ocean the, so if you really had to force me between the two <laughs> that's what I, I i really love the ocean i mean i live by the ocean now but i um i would probably choose mountain see uh, i can i can i can respect that I, I grew up in west virginia you know mountains everywhere around me I, and uh you know there's just something especially in the fall with the leaves changing I mean, we didn't we didn't have yeah. the, the the big mountains. Ours were a little more roll, rolling mountains uh, uh, in in West Virginia, but couldn't couldn't really beat that. And I mean, I love going to the beach for vacation, but you know, kind of spending all all day every day in the mountains was was a lot of fun. And I, I do miss that where I live now, although I'm surrounded by a whole lot more bourbon and a few more things to do in Kentucky. Yeah. So, <laughs> uh, not too bad. Not too no, bad. not at all. Now. You launched, uh, you kind of have a fun story. The last couple of years, people have probably called you crazy uh, more than once. But how did you guys, or how did you come to start your own spirits company? What drove you to do that? Yeah, so I didn't, not many people gave me, told me I'm crazy. They, the, 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 the logical quest or the quest, the most common question was why, mm -hmm. why, why? I, I was CMO of a, of a big Italian company, uh, the number one liquor company in Italy and number six here in the US. Spent over 15 years in this country handling all the marketing and developing new brands, doing great marketing campaigns, multi-million dollar budgets, 30 people working with me, uh, for me. So why, <laughs> right? And um, 
I mean, a great lifestyle in the Bay Area. Uh, the You get to a point, or I got to a point, where your success, what led you to a certain position or achieving a certain uh, objective in your life is actually then preventing you from continuing to do what you love. So by, by doing great, good job in marketing and developing new brands and and seeing this brand grow, uh, I was promoted in different rounds. And uh, the higher you go, the less of the stuff that you liked, mm -hmm. you're gonna do. And you're gonna do more internal management, managing up, up, upwards, as we all know, managing 30 people. It's a great responsibility because these people go home and have their life and they count on you in not having a miserable day uh, in the office. So the, but, all that effort that it took me to get to that level was then redirected to do something that I didn't like, i.e. managing upwards and necessarily managing downwards. And so I, I couldn't do any more what I wanted to do, which, which was creating brands, creating lifestyle brands that could speak to consumers in a unique way and become kind of personable brands for consumers. Me as a consumer, I'm a big runner, big swimmer, big biker, and, and brands in that world, for me, are partners. When you, when you spend six, eight hours on a bike, your bike is your best friend <laughs> because you're spending six, eight hours on this bike. So I love to create brands that give me that feeling of saying, well, I buy this because I trust. I, trust. I know in the end it's a brand. It's not my family or partner and so on, but it, it does give you that moment of reassurance. And that's what I always wanted to do. And I was able to do it in my in corporate world for many, many years. But the successes led me to a point where I wasn't be, being able to do this anymore. And so it, obviously, no, no, no pandemic in sight or anything. It was actually a pretty good economical moment for the, for the country. And I decided Let's do it. What do I really have to lose? And the moment your mind thinks this is more exciting than risky, that's when you make jumps. Now, people will always say, well, that's crazy. But it really depends where your mind is at. I remember, uh, um, I don't know if you ever uh, if you ever saw the documentary Free Solo on uh, Matt, I forgot his last name, but he climbed mm -hmm. the, the El Capitan, right? Yeah. Free. Uh, no ropes or anything. And he would always, the number one question is, did you ever freak out? And he's like, always, every single moment. Now, obviously what he accomplished and what I'm doing are very different things, but the element of risk is a lot is in your mind. And depending on how your mind is framed, you will see the risk and you can control the risk. And the, the way I jumped out of corporate and went my own way it felt a bit like he did, where it's like, I, I know the risk. I recognize the risk. I have it under control. There's always going to be, now, obviously, if it, get, if it went wrong for him, yeah. consequences way bigger than mine. But you know that if you're well prepared, you have a high chance of succeeding. And um, there's always going to be a risk. And as long as you know that there's the risk, that will allow you to avoid doing stupid, stupid things. And I felt that way, exactly that way in February 2017, when it was my first month, I wasn't getting a salary since I started working 28 years ago. So this was the first month in my life, I wasn't reassured of getting a bit of money in my bank account. And it felt weird <laughs> <laughs> because I did have a solution on the other side as well. But the, the enthusiasm of saying, I, from now on, I can forge my path. I can basically create. And it really depends on my motivation of waking up in the morning and trying to do stuff. And that excited me. And so the, the anguish or the anxiety of saying, I don't have a salary coming in, my costs are going out, was mitigated by the fact I don't need to report to anyone right now. I can set up my agenda. I can define my future in the next few years as I want. And, and I know it's very ambitious oriented in the sense that 
it could be even naive because you plan things and then you see, I mean, a pandemic happens and you have to change. But the reality, you're still on the steering, like on a car, you're still a driver. That doesn't mean that everything that goes around you, you're, you don't look at because you're driving, but you are still the driver of that car. And I, that, that really told me this is the right time because I feel the excitement of doing this. And I thought this is the right time to leave a safe haven, safe spot and try something new. And even if that something new is very vague, I'll figure it out. And, and why I'll figure it out is because we are human beings and we'll always figure out our way around things. Um, and so I started really with that excitement without a clear plan. I didn't necessarily, I didn't even know if I wanted to do some, a vodka brand compared to a bourbon or tequila, have a distillery. I didn't know all that. What I knew is that I will create my own brand. They don't need to have my name, I actually stay away from my name, <laughs> but I will create my own brands and the same excitement that I would, I was getting in corporate by seeing brands owned by shareholders, but seeing them in the back bar, because I did some, I contributed somewhere along the way to get them there. It's going to be ma times, times 10, at least if that brand I created and, and that feeling it has been the driver since. February 1st, 2017, I, I was like, I want to get that enthusiasm of seeing a brand that I created out there, bought by people without knowing the background of the, the, the people behind it. They bought it because that brand means something to them. And, and to get someone to spend 20, 25 and actually more $30, uh, I I'm humbled by that for something that I did because I am careful how I spend my money. Now, $30, $30 is not going to rock the bank, but still, you, you, you're you not going to throw away money mm -hmm. like that. And uh, and to get somebody to do that with something that I developed, I'm humbled, but at the same time, it's the biggest excitement I can get in the professional world. Um, and, and I crave for that uh, when I was in my previous company. And now... I'm everything I'm doing is driven purely by the desire of seeing people buy my brands. Well, and too, it's, it's always fun to be in the driver's seat. Cause you know, it's, it's you that's, that's at the wheel. It's, it's, if it goes well, it's you, it's cause you, you were there to guide it. If it goes poorly, you know, that's also on you, you as well. And, and I don't know, there's just something to that. I've always enjoyed that, which is why I enjoyed working my way up, up the ranks, uh, you know, in my, in my day job career, so, so to speak. Um, yeah. You know, you, you talk about it, you know, it's been five years now. You guys have grown pretty quickly, even during COVID. How have you guys been able to do that? And can you also, uh, what, what was it? You sold like maybe a hundred cases of something that first year. Is that, is that yeah. right? <laughs> yeah. Well, we, every entrepreneurial story, I think has its, its point where they were close to shutting down, right? Apple is famous or Steve Jobs was 24 hours from shutting down. And, and so uh, nearly every story will, they will tell you something similar. Now we weren't 24 hours. We were 60 days from <laughs> shutting down, which in a lifespan is probably equivalent to one minute <laughs> from shutting down. But what happened was that, uh, as I left corporate and I started developing this vision, I found a partner who would work with me, although he was more like an in investor coming in. Um, in support, I didn't want to have all the financial weight on my shoulders. Uh, so we partnered together. We, we, we bought, um, we got a space in Eugene. We got a distillery up and running. We started producing vodka. I did all the marketing job behind it to get it, to get a cool brand. What I thought uh, would be a cool brand out there. And then I'm extraction is marketing. I'm not a sales guy. But I had to do obviously the sales role. Now I needed, I've done all the work behind it. Now we need to get it into stores and bars and so on. And that requires more work with a distributor than I ever uh, realized when I was in corporate. <laughs> uh, the process is the same. A big company or me, we all go through the same distributor network. So yeah. the reality is we are all in a logjam following, trying to get attention uh, from the distributor. Uh, obviously if you're a bigger player, you have bigger tools and bigger weight, but
But the reality is still that phone call, that's still that conversation with the salespeople from the distributor. And arrogantly enough, which I'll take the responsibility, obviously, is that I thought I could do that. One, leveraging my past experience my and the name I, I, got, I got in the industry. And two, because I thought it can't be that complicated in the end. It's harder to create a brand from nothing than to get the brand on a, st on a shelf. And the reality is, is it harder long jump or high jump? Well, uh, yeah, they're both the not is, fun. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So they're both hard. And, and so the first year through my incredibly savvy marketing skills, I was able to sell a hundred cases. So <laughs> that basically told me and my business partner that we probably have to look at the things differently because the work done up front, phenomenal but it doesn't really serve any purpose if you can't get mm -hmm. your bottle on the shelf. And that brought me to, to, to get on board and kind of make, take a step back from actually running the whole business, get on board people who are experts in that because the tide, right? Raises everybody. And, and I like, you know what? It's better to invest a bit more in the business, but bringing in people who are salespeople who know, the system, who know who to talk to, who have been there, done that. And, uh, and those a hundred cases in, in honestly, in three months became 1000. And to this day, if you ask me, well, can you do it? Can you do it? I'm like, I have no clue how they achieved it. <laughs> I, I honestly, I mean, they seem to have done the same things I've done, spoken to the same people. But they got an order for 1,000 cases. I was barely able to get 100, and I had to sweat those 100. So th that's that was the key point. It was actually facing a shutdown that forced me to look into hiring and getting on board people who are experts in, in that line of business. And that has changed our trajectory. Now, we went through a pandemic that didn't obviously left some scars on, on, on us, but knowing what happened around the world specifically here and in our industry and in the craft line of our business we are the lucky ones we um we definitely survived we cut our costs to the bare minimum we didn't have to uh, furlough anyone but we reduced or everybody reduced its salary and uh, we kind of like played it very safe for for three four months with no view of what was going on but we you, you inherently remain optimistic until the day somebody comes and says, Hey, it's, you have to shut down. You will, it's just the nature. I think, I think because I'm not a serial entrepreneur, <laughs> but it's the nature of being an entrepreneur of giving up the moment the boat is really sinking. If not, you'll always figure out a way around it and you need a bit of luck, but I'm a believer that the more you work, the luckier you get. So we, 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 worked like really worked hard in the last two years to keep the business not just float alive but actually continue to make it thrive now we i was lucky in one thing uh, i was lucky that the people i hired on the sales side big retail experts and obviously the pandemic in its bad uh, consequences brought a lot of emphasis to retail mm -hmm. and a lot of consumers to retail and all the numbers that you may have been exposed to have shown incredible retail oh, yeah. performance in the last year and a half. So I was lucky that I had the salespeople who could actually sell in that channel very, very well. Uh, if I had gone fully bars, tender mixologist, it would have been a different story because that market didn't ex hasn't existed for more than a year. So that, that is what allowed us, let's say to survive, but but we still had to work hard because everybody was going on retail anyway. So it wasn't like, ah, it's a free pass. Yeah. But it never hurts to ha have that, that extra, uh, you know, uh, tool in your tool belt or, or anything like that. Cause like you said, you just never know what's coming at you. And it, it was nice to have that. Now, before we talk about some of the brands that you guys either have built or, or work with, what's in the name Wolf Spirit? Cause I just find that a very interesting yeah. name. Yeah. So I, there's two animals that I've lived with my whole life. I've been fascinated 
and to your question about mountains and 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 sea they uh, one lives in the sea and and one lives in a mountain well you know, hmm. you find them in mountains as well and so i i'm a lover of dolphins i'm a lover of wolf wolves um it's a kid fascination so no need to go into the background <laughs> of that but um when when we started looking at eugene we looked at distillery oregon and i started learning more about the state obviously i, I don't live very far from oregon but it wasn't my home state uh, i spent a lot of time there really enjoyed the beauty of the pacific northwest one of the key animals there is wolves because they they actually name them and they have them all cataloged uh, especially in oregon to preserve the the race and and i just thought yeah this is a match with heaven because i love wolves wolves are strong in oregon and the wolf is a lot about me meaning i'm a very individual person by and by that i mean i like to spend a lot of time with myself i'm um, i'm not i would probably define myself a bit of a loner that's why i do triathlons and all that stuff i <laughs> hours and hours by myself i don't suffer uh loneliness but at the same time i like to be part of a small tight community a bit like a wolf pack and and i really felt like if there is an animal out there that is not in the water that can best represent me the wolf is it and so rather than call it wolf spirits uh i i really wanted to emphasize the dna of a wolf and and, and its features and then you have a double play with spirit obviously but the reality is that really the this company all the people who are part of it some are hired some they join um they are they all have this feature of being comfortable by themselves but like to be part of a tight small community and there there's something fascinating and at the same time scary about wolves and and that is a, a dual aspect that i tried always to play in my life is to um always play the contrast i love contrast i love like spicy food with sweet stuff and <laughs> i i just because it stimulates us as human beings and it makes us feel alive i think being stimulated by these things taking the extremes and being exposed to both of them um we all need mainstream at some point in our life but the extreme is really what pushes our boundaries and makes us feel alive so wolf for me the wolf became the opportunity of, of bringing to life an animal i adore in a business that i control so since i didn't need to ask permission to anyone that was it <laughs> well I, I i love that i love the logo too and and i i feel too like you just have that that desire that drive to do do i don't want to call them crazy things but you know go out on, into the wild a little bit and even your facility you guys converted an old laundromat into a distillery how did that come about and what was the thoughts on that yeah so originally we went to bend oregon um cool town really loved biking there and phenomenal outdoor life so i thought if i have to spend more time outside the bay area let me choose a place i like mm -hmm. so i went to bend the problem is a lot of distilleries already were there uh, a lot of breweries obviously um more expensive real estate and so my partner he uh, he had gone to college in in eugene and he's like let's check out eugene i had never been in eugene i knew eugene because of prefontaine and the running community it's a very strong town for that and obviously the ducks but i had never actually been in eugene so we enter into eugene and i'm like yeah, I'm not too sure. <laughs> I'm, not, I'm not too sure about the outdoor life here. But the moment we saw real estate so cheap and available, and the fact there was no other distillery there, there was two breweries, I think, but not, no distillery. I thought this is our differentiation point. And then we looked at two spaces and one was a laundromat. And I'm like, man, we can have so much fun here. Um, <laughs> I mean, the whole thing, it's like, it, it just felt like the, the perfect, it just felt perfect. It's like, you know, it used to be a laundromat. Now, instead of washing clothes, we are just producing booze. Hey, and, and, and a lot of it and a lot of different types. And 
Well, and too, it's oh, yeah. it's a it's a great story too because I mean, there's just something about a space. Some spaces talk to you; they have such a history, and or just a unique story that that's worth telling. And I just love the fact that you guys, you know, saw a laundry an old laundry mat and was like, "This could be the future." And you know, one of the brands that came out of all of this is the uh, Blood, Sweat, and Tears Vodka, which. I'm going to get to another cool thing that I love that you do with, with everything is the bottles. But first, just tell me a little bit about the, the vodka and how that came about and, and the name and everything. Sure. So the, the, I, I, since I've worked in the, in the industry many, many years, um, I've been exposed to phenomenal people, phenomenal locations, distilleries all over the world, to be honest, from France, the Scotland, obviously Kentucky, where you are, uh, Jamaica, to, and then Mexico, obviously, and and um, seeing all that kind of daunted me. In like, you know what? I would love to have all these products, but let's go with the fastest thing to produce, and that's vodka. I mean, it's it's. I know it's not romantic. There's a bit, a lot less tradition and 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 history, but it gets a product and does the job. So I, uh, with my partner, we're like, let's try to produce a kick-ass vodka mm-hmm. and maybe create the the Jack Daniels of vodka. That vodka that speaks to you because of its personality more than about its liquid. You still want to have a kick-ass liquid, but you really want to emphasize the personality of the brand. And in vodka, that is incredibly important because in the end, all high distilled spirits, clear sp- distilled spirits like vodka, they, if you mix it, let's say it, they all tastes the same it's there's nothing you you can really do in a mixed cocktail with vodka to make the vodka stand out uh it's completely different with all the other categories but vodka it's the purpose i mean vodka is the neutral spirit by definition so the idea was let's create a vodka brand that has a badass personality and then uh, and then if this business grows let's start looking at other categories that require more investment but this is the, the least capital investment that we need to make if we want to own our own distillery, which was my objective. I didn't want to go out there and buy neutral grain spirits and then just put in a fancy bottle. I actually wanted to have a story. I wanted to have a distiller or somebody who could actually take care of the quality of the liquid, just like I tried to take care of the quality of everything else, packaging, people, and so on. And... Um, the journey to get to that point, buying all the equipment for a distillery, getting the permission, the the logistics, the the compliance. I mean, just the fire exit <laughs> issue took me like two months to figure out how to solve it. And, and it's not me and the people in Eugene, obviously, but just basic stuff like where is the toilets in uh, at a distillery where are you allowed the bonded space compared to the non-bonded space i mean all that stuff felt like honestly huge mountain to climb on a bike with no brakes uh, or no gears you're like i need to take the bike and put it on my shoulder and just do it and uh, and so that whole journey when i was thinking we were brainstorming internally how to call it Big fan of Winston Churchill, always admired the man and what he represented and what he did. And one of his famous quotes was about blood, sweat, tears, and toil. He also had a a fourth word. And I just felt like this is my journey, honestly. Since I left corporate, I'm so happy about it in many respects, but it's been a bloody, sweaty, tearful journey. And I just felt like, okay, it's a long name, but... People get it because it's a term yeah. everybody knows. And it does represent who we are. We, we went through all this and we brought to life uh, a vodka brand through blood, sweat, and tears. Well, and, and two, uh, you guys kind of have a, a mascot, so to speak, with the brand, uh, uh, Mr. Pickles. And you guys also partner with Animal Rescue up there, a, n- a non-kill animal rescue. Can you talk, talk a little bit, a bit about Mr. Pickles and just kind of what he, he represents of the brand? Yeah, he's um, so Ben uh, Green. He's our distiller, a friend of my partner. I got to meet, became very good friends. He um, his life actually he was doing completely different stuff. Um, he, tattoo artist and and in in Southern California lived a life there. And 
he was a bit of a, a, of a dead end and we, we told him, listen, go online and figure out how to make vodka. We'll pay for everything else. And then if you don't mind, what about moving from San Diego to Eugene? <laughs> it's not, give it a try. It won't be that bad. And well, it was crazy enough to uh, agree to that. And, uh, and so he came over and in, at the same time, he got a rescue dog, uh, a pit bull and uh, Mr. Pickles. And when he got it, I'll, I, I'll tell you, I was happy because he, it really stabilized him uh, as a person because pets mm. can do that. They can definitely create, you know, that incredible love that human beings don't always give you. <laughs> <laughs> and, but the, I, whilst I was very happy about that, I was a bit more concerned because when I was seven, and I was back in Italy at the time, my uh, uncle's German Shepherd attacked me when we were at uh, their place for a weekend. And uh, I have vague memories, but I have big stitches in my leg uh, of that attack. And so since then, I've always been, the first years after I was paralyzed by dogs, but or, or freaking out, but, but I've never been 100% hyper comfortable with dogs. And so a pit bull <laughs> kind of told me, wow, I'm not too sure how many times I'm going to visit the distillery. Um, the reality is uh, the, the moment you really get to know pets and, and in this case, this dog and, and then see him operate with Ben, you, you realize it's another dimension and it brought a lot more uh, happiness to the whole family, the wolf spirit family. And um, to the point where we, we literally, Mr. Pickles is part, really is part of the family. Um, we put him on the bottle. Uh, there's a little pit bull there in his, in his, uh, in his, for his joy. Um, and we, um, we decided to, I was looking to do something also to help the community. I was trying to help locally, maybe Eugene, but then. I looked at rescue dogs operation and rescue pets and best friend society. I spoke to the people there. Um, they have our same ethos, young people who are trying to make a difference. Now they had a phenomenal year and a half with the pandemic, uh, because people were getting pets all over the place. Uh, and now obviously they're, they're seeing what's happening is that people are going back to the office and they're like, ah, I don't know, maybe I don't need this dog anymore. So we are now seeing a bit of a, the downside of that and we as humans can be pretty bad in these things sometimes but um we we want to support them they they've been very generous with us uh and and we truly believe in the cause um and even I, i'm i'm not 100 percent converted i would get a dog immediately if i didn't live the lifestyle that i live that basically would prevent the dog from seeing me 10 hours a day. And that's not good to the dog. Plus it doesn't really, it does it wouldn't really gratify me either. Well, and, and, and I love to the, just how the dog became integrated into everything you mentioned on the bottle. I feel like that's one thing you guys do is you have a lot of fun with your, the logo work, the bottle work. I mean, yeah, I've got a puncher's chance bottle here. Uh, for those that are, are watching, not listening and kind of take a peek at that. You know, what, 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 how much emphasis do you guys put on that and how important is it for it to kind of stand and, and pop, you know, especially where you guys are newer brands that people may not have heard of. That's my, uh, that's my ultimate passion. Um, I, when I entered the spirits world, I didn't understand at the beginning, I didn't realize how important packaging is. And I'm really specifically focused on spirits, uh, beer and wine operate at different level. And then obviously soft drinks and other beverages, wholly different. But spirits is the only category in the beverage world that operates predominantly on a marketing packaging basis. Um, you, um, you, you, you always have an opportunity of sampling a product on, in a bar. Mm -hmm. uh, rarely you, you buy it one, a 750 of a product that you've never tasted or you have no clue just to try unless it's incredibly cheap. If not, it's not something you're gonna, you're gonna do very comfortably because let's say you don't like it. It doesn't feel good to throw away a lot of, a lot of booze. 
So the packaging for me, and by packaging, it's the dressing of the whole thing. So it includes the brand name uh, and, and the whole world, the visual identity that you create through the bottle. Packaging for me is the ultimate, uh, the ultimate job for a marketer in this industry because it's pretty much like designing cars or supercars. I, I worked for Ferrari, my first first job. And so as much as that car in Formula One is iconic and so on, uh, the Formula One spectator is not really focused on that. But the everyday, everyday average consumer has a Ferrari in mind and the, they've been through how many models, right? Over the years, it's not like there's one Ferrari and that's it. Whichever model you look at, it's consistent through time. And you see a Ferrari drive by, everybody will turn around then. And, and, and for me, packaging has always been like, I need to create the Ferraris of the spirits industry. The, all of them in the sense that you recognize the design and the style, even if the engine and the features are different, the colors are different, not all Ferraris are red, right? So even if the things are different, you recognize that and you buy into that because it's Italian, high-end Italian design lifestyle and it's a signature of success. And so for me, in the spirits business is always like, I need my bottle to tell a story or make a statement. Uh, either way, that bottle needs to do, deliver more than just the liquid inside. And uh, with blood, sweat, and tears, we are literally telling a story. As you know, I mean, you look at the bottle, it's, there's a lot going on. Uh, we kept the logo very simple, precisely because everything else is very busy. So you, again, the contrast, right? Keep, keep things uh, very separate and opposite ends, and people will navigate between the two. If you get them too close, it will create confusion. Uh, with puncher's chance, the opposite. I uh, No story to tell here, make a statement, a statement that people understand and keep the logo simple yet striking. And, uh, and the feature of the bottle is obviously this very intricate logo or writing of puncher's chance that when you get close, you're like, wow, there's a lot going on here. But from far, you can read it very, very easily. And then we have a fading on the bottom just so that you can see, you can see the liquid, um, which you can't with blood, sweat and tears. Now, why is it a black bottle in vodka? Well, I think the American consumer is trusting that every vodka is clear at this point. I think we, we you drank know. enough vodka <laughs> after years, right? So the whole concept where absolute to name one brand, but a lot of the brands created their, their history is about the purity of vodka and that translated into clear bottles. Um, I don't think that is needed anymore or let's put it this way, Umberto and his own business decided that they want to try something different and not educate Americans on the color of the vodka, but on the lifestyle of a vodka brand made in the Pacific Northwest by guys who had nothing else to do in their life, then try something very, very different. Well, and, and I, I love it too, because the, the puncher's chance bottles, the one that I've, I've been able to see up close and personal and it stands out on the shelf, the design, you know, it just, even just the look of the bottle itself is a little bit different. The black, everything kind of, you know, catches your eye, which is what you're hoping for. Um, and that's what I'm drinking tonight. Uh, can you, can you talk a little Cheers. bit? Yeah. And it's been a, a, I'm almost done with my bottle, which we've, we've highlighted on our give it a try highlight. Now I've highlighted it with several friends. Can you talk a little bit about it, how it came to be? And you know, you've got, yeah. you go from a vodka to, you know, a Kentucky straight bourbon whiskey, which is a marriage of, I think yeah. what, four or five and six year old whiskeys from Kentucky. Yes, correct. So th there's a couple of things going on. Um, so what happened was as we, we were seeing that the, the, the team had in place. So I had, really the right people on board at Wolf Spirit. And the vodka was starting to sell well. And uh, I, I I was starting to think, well, maybe, maybe we should look into expanding. And there were three categories I, I, I've been looking at. One was, uh, one is obviously bourbon, American whiskey. Originally it was, let's think American whiskey first and then see what, how far we can get close to bourbon and then Kentucky bourbon. Second was, um, was agave spirits. Mm -hmm. I didn't want to do a tequila because I've done a tequila, uh, in my previous <laughs> job. And I, I think I can't better what I did there. So I'm not going to challenge my own self, 
but uh, I've always kept an open mind on mezcal. And then the third was gin, because obviously you see that mm. when you're producing vodka to move to gin is also relatively easy. So the, it just happened that um, bourbon became an opportunity in terms of sourcing liquid. And that is the number one issue. Mm. I wanted, I really wanted a Kentucky straight bourbon. Uh, I could have definitely gone and buy what, what is available in the market, very high quality bourbons, but they're not from Kentucky. And I really wanted the Kentucky part. I, and the reason is not because I have a distillery there, not because I have phenomenal Jimmy Russell, <laughs> master distiller of the distillers. I, it's because I wanted to root myself into what I believe through my experience working on bourbon is the best quality bourbon that comes out in general tends to be from Kentucky. There's geographical reasons to it. There's climate reasons to it. And there's a, an inevitable reality that it's embedded in the culture mm -hmm. of the state, just like horse breeding is embedded. And there's a reason why the 80% of the horses are coming from Kentucky. It's because if it's in the culture of the state, it will take multiple generations to take it out and it's not going to go out nope. because there's more barrels <laughs> than human beings in Kentucky anyway. So, so I, I wanted that now figuring out the source was number one. Now what brand to create? And I'll, again, I hope I don't go too, oh, you're too, good. <laughs> too long here, but what I, what I, the reality is that the bourbon market, the American whiskey market leverages a lot of common pillars with consumers in terms of communication and, and so on. And one is about the distiller or the founder. So you, you, your Jack Daniels and Jim Beam were all created by Mr. Jack Daniel and Mr. Jim Beam. So they are now marketing brands, but the reality is there were people behind it. Mm. And that was a century ago. So a lot of those brands leverage the fact that they have an incredible history and uh, the whiskey barons, right? The people who really started especially before prohibition started this whole movement. They owned the land, owning the land allowed it to have control of water. The number one ingredient and most important ingredient in whiskey is water. So the next step was, okay, I own the land, I'll grow some corn and I'll grow some wheat and then I'll start blending stuff and here is bourbon. So all those histories exist and there are phenomenal brands out there that leverage it. Then there's another pillar that focuses on bringing brands to life in a very modern way and look at the new frontier and more like the Western world. And you have brands like High West, Bullet Bourbon. They leverage a lot of that because it's, it, it, it is contemporary, but it's still rooted in America. It's not a hyper modern, mm -hmm. but they look at bourbon with a, with a new twist, which I personally like. Um, then the third, which is a bit more of a shortcut, not a big fan because I, I think it, lazy marketers honestly tend to do this is the celebrity route right so i'll get my next big a actor sports guy whatever i'll get him to sponsor my brand or to champion my brand i'll give him x equity and he's gonna he or she is gonna say oh i'm fully vested here i'm not a big fan of that uh although great success stories recently right we all read it in the news so but despite that, I felt like I didn't want to go that route. I don't have a century of history. And the new frontier world is already there. And there's some big players doing a phenomenal job there. So I needed to carve my space out uh, somewhere. And it just happened in that moment. I, I was being exposed more and more because the, the real good marketer, I think, is the one who's always open-minded never comes in with a, an opinion, can always shift if, she, if he or she, or she sees things moving and is observant of everything that goes around. The very good marketer does very little talking and a lot of listening. And, and I was just observing this trend of, of, uh, of all these uh, physical activities in gyms of people doing all this boxing and fighting and, and punching and all this stuff, which I always thought weird. I grew up in the eighties when Mike Tyson was starting to come up and he was a myth of mine. And then boxing went into the dark ages. I mean, boxing as a, as a sport is still a bit in the dark ages 
I'm putting UFC and martial arts aside, but the pure boxing kind of fell off. And I thought there's something going on here because the average consumer is doing a lot of this stuff, uh, but they're not watching it on TV. They're watching UFC. So I'm like, there, there's, there's a movement happening under underground that I can leverage, but then I can move it to transpose the, the same values of that movement, anchor it to UFC and maybe combine it to an American tradition, which is bourbon. And, and I just felt like this seems to be a perfect match in heaven because boxing is the ultimate sport because there, there's no other sport like boxing that puts two human beings in front of each other. They beat the hell out of each other and then they hug at the end. I mean, yeah. you're just like, why? But the reality is you can be the wealthiest guy in the world. You, you get on a ring, you mean zero. You are at the same level of the person in front of you. You're the most successful, whatever. And I like that leveling of boxing, that boxing does to you. I like the fact that it brings us all back to the ground and makes forces us to act, um, really goes to the inner of ourselves. But at the same time, I still wanted to tie to bourbon. And, and I think what boxing gives you is that spirit of always fighting, always believing that in the end, you could n knock out your, your adversary with just one punch. And um, the famous Buster Douglas, Mike Tyson match that a fight that I never forget is, is exactly that. I mean, Mike Tyson knocked out Buster Douglas twice during that, that fight. And then at the eighth round, I think Buster Douglas did it one punch and, and that's the puncher's chance. And, uh, and we, as a company and people in America as a culture, me as an immigrant who moved to here. We all believe in our puncher's chance. We all believe that we are the under, we know we are the underdog and we all believe that we can change the, the direction, um, and the fate of our, of our life, even by being, even by being the underdog. So I felt as an American, it's in the American spirit of fighting for what you believe in, in the hope of winning. It's in the American spirit of having a bourbon um, in, in your house. I mean, it's part of American tradition, just like you would have probably Campari and so on in Italy. And, and so I felt like this, this is a good match because I can talk about bourbon in a modern way, contemporary way, meaningful way without saying, Hey, and by the way, my liquid, uh, is, is not good or, or sorry, my liquid is bought elsewhere and so on. No, I have a legitimate Kentucky bourbon, but I'm not a distiller who's been around 150 years. If I'm being very transparent, this is not distilled liquid from us five years ago, but we have a partnership with a company that has been buying bourbon for the last five years and has an incredible experience and an incredible collection. They have five warehouses in Danville and, and the quality of the liquid is, is phenomenal. So I actually have a source that is legitimate and I created a brand that is meaningful. I think for, for a lot of consumers, it happened that the pandemic happened, unfortunately, and that brought the message of resilience even more to the forefront. Again, that wasn't on purpose, obviously, but, <laughs> but inevitably we, we all feel underdogs at this point in our life because we are all trying to climb back to a certain level of normality. Well, and then everyone lo loves a, a good underdog story too. And, and I'm, I'm guessing, you know, I, I kind of already know this a little bit, but I'm, I'm guessing this isn't going to be the only bourbon released from the puncher's chance brand. Is there some, some more down, no, down the I, pipeline? I'll give, you, I'll give you a preview. We are, we'll be launching before the end of the year, a limited release of a 12 year old aged in uh, Cabernet Sauvignon casks. Nice. Sorry, finished in Cabernet Sauvignon cask. It's a 12 year old bourbon. So now you're stepping up definitely the quality. And uh, because it's 12 and if you, uh, if you know how boxing works, it's 12 rounds is the distance. So we called it the distance. So puncher's chance, the distance will be available uh, towards um, October. 
Well, and, in Kentucky for sure, and a few other markets. And, and, and for those that that might know how to go find logos and and uh, the releases, I can tell you that you you done some, did some good work on the uh, how you spell distance with the twelve and and everything. Yeah. There, there's always a little little extra in there, and I and I love that. Yeah. And you know, it's not just a vodka and a bourbon you have. Can you talk a little bit about the other uh, spirits that you work with and that are either yours or that you've partnered with to bring here to America? Sure. Yeah, the the two two more. Um, another vodka. Um, now this vodka story is is really dear to my heart. Um, I was still in my previous company, and uh, I was approached by these two gentlemen from Finland. Um, they were looking for an importer in the U.S. Uh, they had an idea. Uh, Finland had gone through the hundredth anniversary of their independence. And in commemoration of their independence, they had released a post stamp of a, a artwork from a, an artist called Tom of Finland, who passed away at the end of the 90s. And uh, they released this post stamp of his artwork, and it sold like crazy all over the world. I mean, to the point where they, the post office in, in Finland couldn't produce anymore. They had run completely out. So these two gentlemen, reached out to me and they said, Hey, I, we do think that we have an opportunity here, um, of creating, uh, of, lo of creating a brand vodka, gin, you tell us, but under this trademark, Tom of Finland. Now you have to know that Tom of Finland has a foundation in LA. And so maybe you should go there and talk to the guys. They all ultimately own the trademark and, uh, they, they are the, one of the key people of the foundation was the partner of Tom of Finland. So you, you should maybe learn more of the brand from them. Now I had no clue who Tom of Finland was and I, I had zero visibility on his art. Uh, I just loved the name and, uh, and, and the moment I went online now, I what you, you have to imagine, I'm in an office environment. So with, with all the checks and balances of office it systems, right? So I'm, I'm checking online on Tom of Finland artwork and I see all these red flags popping on the screen and I'm like, what am I doing wrong here? So back at home where I don't have all the security and protection that the companies give you, uh, I do it on my personal laptop and I'm like, oh, wow. Okay. <laughs> I get it. So for those who don't know, Tom of Finland was probably the most iconic and most influential gay artist ever. And, uh, through his artwork, uh, which was definitely, uh, he had to push the boundaries, but through his artwork, he championed basically the gay movement that many, many years later, after he passed away, probably led to what we have now, at least in the U S a, a, a whole LGBTQ community that can stand up proudly for what, for what they believe in and for what they want. And gay marriage was probably the, the biggest item of the whole thing. So the, but his artwork to, to give you a sense influenced people like Freddie Mercury, like, um, the, I mean, there's rock bands that followed his, his artwork. He, he, he portrayed men, beautiful men, it, always happy together and always happy as a way of saying there's nothing wrong in being gay. And you really have to go back 20 years and imagine that message would have been incredibly controversial mm -hmm. and it is incredibly controversial now in many parts of the world still. And so that whole story, plus the pure artwork, which was phenomenal, that whole story made me think we have an opportunity here again, one to communicate, which is for me, the most important thing, communicate a message of peace and love, but especially love and tolerance peace is we all hope for peace. I mean, mm -hmm. nobody's really out there asking for war, but love and tolerance. And at the same time, bring to life another spirit. Now, because of the, the target consumer we have very focused, it made sense to do a, uh, sorry, a vodka. Um, plus obviously Tom of Finna himself was both a vodka and a gin drinker. So we, we, we were thinking gin or vodka then since we wanted to produce it in Finland and everything sourced out of Scandinavia and the North Nordics, vodka was the logic one because they get the purest water. We could add rye, 
which we could, we could source very easily in, um, in Finland. And so we felt like we can create and make it organic because it's pretty much mandatory. Any product in <laughs> Finland is pretty much organic. So we, we, we thought we had a very different, very different proposition for blood, sweat and tears, both in terms of the liquid and in terms of the story, obviously packaging radically different. And the story is phenomenal because because we are really bringing to the gay community, but overall, the socially enlightened community, to be honest, a product that speaks to them in a very authentic manner. We are not putting a rainbow around a bottle and say, hey, in June, hey, we all support you guys. No, this is a, a brand for them and not done temporarily to celebrate them during the month of June. The second brand uh, I'm working on that we just launched is a mezcal. As I mentioned before, um, I wanted to play in agave spirit and I felt um, tequila was, wasn't was the way. Um, but I, 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 I've been to, to Durango, which is a state um, south of Jalisco, where the majority of tequilas are made. Um, and I, I saw the production of mezcal and I felt like Wow. Talk about traditional, artisanal. Mm -hmm. You can't get more artisanal than mezcal. I mean, the moment the donkey is moving the rock that's helping to crush the agave, you're like, yeah. I mean, the only electricity is used to keep a light bulb on when they do it, when they do it at night. If not, it's all artisanal. It's all manual. And, I, and the flavor itself is incredibly different from tequila. It, it is like you're 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 closer to the Isla Scotch whiskies, so the smoky ones, then you're close to tequila. Mm -hmm. And so I felt like okay, here I can leverage all, all everything that Mexico brings to you, and the fact that it's anyway up in the sphere of agave, but at the same time there's an incredible story behind it in the way it's produced and so genuine and. I, uh, I fell in love with Mexico when I created Espanol Tequila. I fell in love because I discovered a Mexico that wasn't the Mexico most Americans are exposed to. Uh, a Mexico that is, yes, religious and obviously very, very Latin and family oriented. But back to my uh, story of extreme, a Mexico that is full of extremes, where, where you have danger and joy living in the same place at the same moment. You're, I've been out there in the evenings partying with Mexico, Mexicans and, and literally until three in the morning, then they would take me to the hotel because it wouldn't be safe to walk back to the hotel. So you're partying and then you have a moment of danger. And then the following morning at 9 a.m., we were all in church. I'm a Catholic coming from Italy, so it came kind of natural. But, and then all of a sudden you're back into a, a sort of normality. And, and your, your Mexico is constantly like that. If you get out of the freaking resorts and, and get out of the margaritas and cheesy stuff, this is the real Mexico. And I really fell in love with it. And, and the moment I figured out a partner who could produce a high quality mezcal, I'm like, I want to have a mezcal in my portfolio because I just think Mexico deserves more uh, to be exposed more to the American consumer the real Mexico. It's, it's phenomenal. I mean, you have forests, deserts, mountains, the ocean. There's so much history. There's food is phenomenal. The drinks are incredible. Um, and the people are phenomenally young. And then something that you will realize with all the developing nations, and we are less exposed in America, definitely very little in Europe, is how young these nations are. And not young in history, but they have a young populations. Uh, because they are still growing. I, I mean, America is growing because they're getting more immigrants. Europe birth rate is declining. We, we, I, when I grew up in Italy, I mean, you weren't used to seeing kids all over the place. Yeah, in school. But other than that, it's always media, like middle aged and older people <laughs> were walking around. And that's Italy because we are an old nation. We're, we're getting older. Japan is the same. You go in Mexico and you're like, wow, there's young people all over the place. It's like, it's phenomenal. It's hectic, <laughs> but 
it's phenomenal. And you realize all this reality is literally a few hours south of San Diego, even less. So you, it's, it's a country next door to America, but it feels five hours away or mile, millions of miles away. It's, and, I, and I still think for Americans, it's the biggest thing I always push to the people here in this country is travel. I mean, don't do it now, but when, when it's going to be safe again, come travel, get out of this country, or even just, I've been in 45 states in this country and I aiming to get to 50 eventually. It, it blows up your mind when you meet other people from other countries, other cultures, other habits, it stimulates you. And then you still go back home to your comfort. There's nothing wrong with that. But being exposed to all that, makes you so much a better person. Uh, I big champion of that. Well, and, and it just gives you a better perspective on, on everything. And, and I, the, the mescals that I, you know, the, doing this podcast, I've gotten to learn a lot more about other spirits, you know, everyone knows vodka and gin and, and some of those, but mescal is, is one that's been new to me, but my goodness, when you talk about like how vodka, you know, it's pretty much, you know what you're getting, things like that. Mezcal, there's a whole different flavor profile and a whole wide variety. Um, I, I'd almost say it's like a bourbon in the sense of, or, or a scotch whiskey where depending on how it's done, you could have two totally different, um, uh, flavor profiles right. there. And, and I, I love to see it. And, and the Mezcal, what is it called that you guys are, are, are launching? Or launch. So we kept the name, yes, simple. And uh, to my point of making statements, we are back into a statement. So the brand is called Boscal, uh, basically the boss of Mezcal. Um, and, and this is really the, the, the brand, the premises of the brand is to bring Mezcal to the people. Mezcal is a way older spirit than tequila in Mexico. I mean, it's way, way, way older. Back to the Aztec empire. So there's a, there's a, a, an incredible, in a certain sense, it is kind of mezcal for the Mexicans is a tequila's daddy in a certain sense, because similar to, you know, the saying, every bourbon is a whiskey, but not every whiskey is a bourbon. Well, every tequila is a mezcal, but not every mezcal is a tequila. So tequila uses one specific type of agave plant in a specific way and cooked in a specific manner. Mezcal can be done with multiple variants of agave plants and cooked in many different ways. Uh, so it, it, they're starting to regulate it a bit more because they're seeing obviously the growth, but it's still, there's a lot to your point. You can still do a lot to impact the flavor. And so I really felt like we need a, we need to democratize mezcal. So no more the 70, 80, $90 bottles of mezcal. Let's try to make it a price more affordable. And then let, let's make a flavor profile that is also more approachable. So the smokiness, we are tearing it down a bit toning it down a bit so that consumers don't feel that immediate smoke uh, impact. Some of them love it, which is great, but we went more, again, democratize, democratize this. And we have on the label, a rabbit looking at the moon and then the whole thing, explore it online, you will see it. But here again, it's a question of democracy. The, the, the rabbit and the moon is a mythological story. It has one version of it in Asia. There's another version in Mexico. And obviously we took the Mexican version, which really speaks to the democratization and, and leveling the ground because it's basically an Aztec God who came to earth and he said, I want to see how these human beings live on earth. And after a week, he realizes that he's going to starve. He doesn't know how to cook, um, how to kill, how to, how to fetch food. And so he's basically starving to death. And a rabbit shows up and says, what's going with you? And he's like, ah, you know, I'm, I was a God. I came here to learn about humans. And I'm like realizing I'm going to die because I'm just not equipped to live the life here. And the rabbit is like, well, you can eat me. I'll sacrifice myself and you'll be safe. And the God is like, oh, I can't let you do that. I will take you with me up again. And I, I'll save you and I'll give you a spot on the moon that you will always be safe there because your gesture of sacrificing yourself deserves that. So I'm not going to kill you, but I'm going to give you a spot on the moon. Now, fast forward to nowadays, you have a full moon, give a look at the full moon and you may see a shadow that represents a rabbit. Uh, you Google it online, you can actually see the exact form of a rabbit on the moon. 
And that mythological story, I felt like, really resembles, again, back to the ethos of Wolf Spirit, the underdog, the humble guys who get things done. Well, and, and I love it, too, because a lot of times there for a while in this industry, there were stories that weren't exactly, you know, oh, I found a recipe in my, my you know, that meh, later on we found out may not have been true. Some are true. Nothing wrong with that. Love those. But I, I love that everything of, of yours tells a story that is true to you all and, and gives an insight into what, what you all bring. And, and my final question is, is what's next? What Anything else coming out or, or are you just kind of yeah. hoping to build on the success you've already had? I, um, I never did this tattoo, but because it doesn't sound good, but, or it doesn't look good put on the skin. But my, my ultimate sentence is if I rest, I rust. So it wouldn't work. It wouldn't be a good. You put it right across the back, maybe. (laughs) Yeah, that's a good idea. (laughs) So that all the guys I I overtake on the bike, they see it. Yeah, maybe. I'm not too sure. (laughs) Um, Anyway, so yes, if I rest, I rust. So definitely I am thinking I am working on another. And as I mentioned to you, I tick the box of whiskey, tick the box of agave. And so next is a gin. Now, I'll tell you something. The gin is going to be produced in in, in Eugene by Ben. And uh, it is closely connected to Ben and maybe somebody else. And uh, although the brand is not going to be blood, sweat, tears, there's going to be a close link to it. And believe me, it's going to be an incredible fun gin. And the purpose, this idea or this thought of mine came during the pandemic, knowing that eventually we would have come out of it. I mean, eventually we will. I mean, that's just how history is. But I I, I thought coming out of a pandemic and all the hard times we've been going through, if I have a spirit, if I have a, a brand that can actually give you a bit of relief and smile and laugh, make you laugh a bit, and so that you have a moment where you don't take everything so serious, why not? And uh, and th- this gin it has been really created with the spirit of doing something lighthearted. Um, we're still going to put all the effort we can between the ingredients and the production to get high quality gin. The brand is going to be really a fun brand, really to make people smile. They will look at the bottle, they will hear the name. It, 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 you will exactly you're already smiling <laughs> i haven't even told i know you. i i just everything i've heard i can only imagine and i just i just i, I just love that and, and i can't wait to see what see what it is and and umberto i i really appreciate you taking uh, some time to talk all the different things you you have been able to create in your amazing career and, and all the the you, you just see the heart and, and soul that goes into this and, and it's really cool and i really appreciate that Jonathan, you've been a great host. Um, I can talk this all night long. Maybe one next time I'm in Louisville, I'll, 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 uh, I'll ring you up and we'll have a punches chance together. Um, thank you again for having us. But I, I really, the, the key message is for anyone out there who's doubting of, of, of trying to do something him or herself, um, just think of it. If, if, if you get thrilled, you're heading in the right direction. If you just get scared and you're just angry at your boss, well, muscle it through because corporate, if I didn't go through my corporate experience, I wouldn't be where I am. So I'll always be blessed and thankful for the corporate experience. It just happens. It just happened at a point in time. It was time to move on, but you, you should feel it inside of you. If, if it's the right thing to do and always, listen to other people's advice, but ultimately you're on the front line. So stick to what you believe in. And then people ultimately will rally around you. Well, I, I appreciate that. Uh, and that is some, some great advice. And folks, remember, follow us on all of our social media, at Hop Spirits, all one word, Instagram, Facebook, Twitter, TikTok, YouTube, you name it. We're there, hopspirits.com. Uh, and, and just uh, find us on your favorite podcast player. Umberto, thanks again.